to video on Lewisburg Federal Prison in uh, um, Pennsylvania. The reason why is because I've had people ask me about prisons in other states like Indiana and Pennsylvania. I really don't, can't speak on those. And plus I got a couple subscribers that are from Pennsylvania. So let's, uh, let's get into this. These are what we call homemade shanks. Weapons. Shanks or homemade knives. What's, I'm sorry, what's the term? Shanks or homemade knives. This is a pretty nice one because you can get a, get that grip on there for your fingers here. And you, these are pretty commonplace here in penitentiaries. People just yeah, you see how big those are? <clears throat> There's a probably a metal factory there or a tag plant where they make license plates or something. Cause that's the only way I see you get any, any that big. Just like the Missouri State Penitentiary had the tag plant, they made license plates, their swords came out of there. Carry these around for protection and anticipation of maybe getting attacked by somebody. So if they're confronted, then they have a weapon to defend themselves because it's no fist fights here. I'm sorry, no fist fights? No fist fights. I mean, if you're gonna have a fight, it's gonna be with a shank. That's the way it was a lot of times at the the walls too. There wasn't a whole lot of fighting. There was, you know, it was all shanks or people hitting one another with locks or canned goods or mop ringers or anything, you know. Because it's quick. Who wants to wrestle? This is fairly nice here. Nice grip on here, the black tape, and used to take care of business if you have to. So I want to go back to what you said a second ago about no fist fights. What I mean by no fist fights, if you're going to have a confrontation, it's not going to be with your fists. You're going to fight somebody that's a serious, of a serious nature, and you're going to use your weapon of choice, and you're going to defend yourself. So what, so what you're saying is someone is is prepared then to really stab another person. Well, if you go fight in a penitentiary, it's not to be bullshitting around. It's going to be to injure somebody or to incapacitate them. The Special Housing Unit is a prison within a prison, holding 180 inmates under... The hold, that's what it means. Segregation. Administrative segregation. 23-hour day lockdown. What's up, man? It's for those inmates who don't play by the rules. It's Lewisburg segregation and solitary confinement cell block. The country falls apart. Brothers who were friends down for Mac 10s, driving off the grill. Bennies and popping pills. Brothers against brothers. Taking step brothers. Uzi's on the bike. Killing on sight. The spirits are free. Shoot and OD. Blasting TV. Down from PCP. They find China White. Stay in 
same how night or put in the blood of Mexican mud. Although the six by eight foot cells were meant for one man, they now house two inmates. We need ventilation inside these cells also. We need these tree slides over to get some air. We got a window in the cell, but no air can blow through. So the air can't, can't blow in properly also. The cell windows can't be opened, and most of the air that circulates into the cells comes through the food slots called wickets, which are often kept closed. A lot of times the wickets are kept closed because uh, we had a little problem up here. I guess it was a couple months ago where uh, zip guns were being made. That's where you roll up a magazine real tight, make a little hole in it, put in uh, pencil heads and matchsticks and things like that, and it shoots out like a gun. And we had a little problem up here on the floors where they were being made and they were being shot at the officers. So as a result, the wickets were being kept closed. Uh, sometimes from time to time fires are being set when the wickets are open, uh, clothes are being thrown out on the range and fires are being set. Yeah, and the whole people flood their cells, set fires, and do all kinds of things, you know. A lot of it's just for attention, you know. Uh, they get down there and get they get bored, you know? Or some of them, there's a serious issue and the guards are not uh, addressing it. So they're doing that to, so the guards will, you know, come and talk to them. It's the only way they can get their attention. So the wits are being kept closed for those uh, different reasons. Sometimes beating on the doors, kicking the doors, and uh, whenever staff comes in, it gets uh, well, either gets quiet or it gets louder. You know, it depends on the situation. Again. <laughs> That's Dr. Death there. Dr. Red Door was convicted of murder and attempted murder. On his way to make a drug buy, Red went to the wrong house and shot three innocent members of a family. Red was sentenced to 85 years in prison. That tattoo, uh, I put that tattoo on about uh, six years ago. Uh, I don't know, I guess it's a mark of time. That's all, it's my mark of time. What are some of the other tattoos you have? Got a big uh, skull, huh? Yeah, that skull a friend of mine put on one day. He drew it up and then tacked that on there. Over here I got a warrior from my warrior days. Uh -huh. And uh, over here I got a bunch of eyeballs. My, yeah, my friend Wes put these eyeballs on. These little double skulls here. Another little thing a friend did out of boredom. This here is a memory of my father. This tattoo has the most meaning. I mean, this is my father's. Most prison tattoos have meanings. Uh, he said that one guy put that one on there out of boredom. Uh, maybe so, but uh, I, I doubt it. It probably has some of the meaning. But uh, a lot of tattoos have meaning, you know. And I tell people out here not to get prison tattoos, you know, just to have prison tattoos, you know, because and they're not cool. They mean something to the people who've been in prison. And somebody might check you on that someday, you know. Gravestone for me. 
I'm unable to go uh, visit his stone. I have yet to see it. This is my stone in memory of him. Uh, this little monster walking down the side of my arm there. It's just a monster. It's just a gall. You know. How about those swastikas on your back? You know? Oh, them swastikas are from when I was a, a youngster. Back when I was searching to identify with something. And, uh, you know, I was never into the, the Hitler thing. It's not on there for a symbol of the Third Reich or all the stuff like that. It symbolizes mostly a symbol for the white people and in prison, white, white youth. Uh, everybody's got different symbols they you know the, the different cultures use and that was that's one that uh, well, do, do a lot of guys tattoo swastikas on there? yeah and it's 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 contrary to the meaning uh that uh like hitler used in the third reich uh it's a prison tattoo it's a it's a symbol of you know our culture white you just symbolizes white The United States imprisons more people than any other country in the world. South Africa has the second highest incarceration rate. The Soviet Union ranks third. The U.S. government predicts that by the year 2000, there will be more than one and a half million Americans in prison. Yeah, I forgot to tell you all this. I think it said from the 90s. And, uh... So they said one and a half. I think it's two million now that's incarcerated in the United States. And 75% of these inmates will be sentenced for drug related crimes. In 1973, U.S. attorneys charged Herbert Sperling with being one of the chief bosses in an organized crime, multi-million dollar heroin smuggling operation. Sperling was New York's link to the French connection, importing hundreds of kilos of pure heroin from France and supplying them to major dealers on the east coast of the United States. Sperling was indicted by a federal narcotics task force he was sentenced to life without parole. So did you ever think you would be uh, pushing your parole? Or? Well, in, in life, most people don't think that they're going to be doing menial labor. But I don't look at it as menial labor. Uh -huh. Why don't you look at it as menial labor? Uh, most things are what you think they are. I'm not menial, so I don't think anything I do is menial labor. My mind is very strong. You've been, you've been uh, incarcerated for how long, Herbie? Almost 17 years. 17 years? Yeah, and I still can't get the law. You're, st you're still appealing your... I certainly am, every day. The papers I gave you to prove that Professor Dershowitz uh, sent allegations to the Court of Appeals about the original judge, Judge Pollock, on my case, uh, conspiring with the U.S. Attorney on how to defeat my motions and why I can't get the law. I can't get a hearing. And everybody says you can't be framed. If I can't be framed, why can't I get the hearing? You told me also that your son is in prison as well? No, my son was framed by the government because of Nicky Bonds trying to get out of jail. What the government does is they arrest somebody and they charge him with myriad crimes. I'm sorry, with what kind of crimes? Myriad crimes, a great number of crimes. Oh, myriad crimes. I, I, I don't mean to use too big of words. I don't want to confuse the audience. Okay. They get somebody, they arrest them for a lot of crimes that they allege he committed. Now the guy doesn't want to go to jail. So what does he do? He trades in 30 or 40 other people for himself so he don't go to jail. The government knows crime by its nature is a secret thing. How could one or two people know about three, 400 people? But they use them to testify, all right, and destroy 
30, 40, 50 people's lives so they can get out of prison. These guys aren't informants or stool pigeons, they're liars. They make up stories and they destroy other people and their families in exchange for getting out of jail themselves. That's what Nicky Barnes did to my son. So your son was uh, accused of being a, a drug... Uh... My son was accused of being involved in a drug conspiracy. Total lie. The kid is 100% innocent. The only reason they did it is because of me being in jail, obvious to put some kind of pressure on me, and I don't make up stories about nobody. I don't play that game. Nicky Barnes, as I recall, was a big time. Uh... <laughs> Come on, Ethan. I'm not going. Bringing uh. He's accused of bringing a lot of heroin in, and uh, he's saying that the government's having people make up lies about him just to get him, him and his son. I don't know if that's true or not, you know. Oh, and salesman, wasn't it? Nicky Bonds is a girl, and I hope we have this on TV. I'm sorry. Nicky Bonds is a girl. That's what he is. I don't know what he was or what he wasn't. I don't know the man. That's the whole point of everything. I happen to be... What do you mean by Nicky Barnes is a girl? He's, he's, a, he's a girl. He's a fag. He's a punk. So what kind of sense? In fact, I shouldn't say he's a punk and a fag because I'm insulting punks and fags. <laughs> In federal prisons, inmates must work at a job assignment. They're paid 22 cents an hour. Lewisburg has a large metal factory. See, I was telling you, they had to have a uh, metal factory or something going on to have all those uh, big shanks. But 22 cents an hour? Even in Missouri, uh, uh, the factories paid more than that. They call it. Missouri inter, uh, vocational enterprises. And I think it starts out at 60 cents an hour. But, um, <laughs> In operation 16 hours a day, it manufactures office furniture. You called hard hands because you're a dishwasher? Well, I'm called hard hands for many reasons. I was hard hands on the street before I came to Lewisburg. Well, uh, anything else you want to say? That's all you know. This is a job, seven days a week, uh, from seven in the morning to seven in the evening. So we got two, six, two shifts of people, you know? I'm, is there any more questions that you would like to ask? Yeah, what kind of problems you got in here? Well, it's always problems. But the problem can't be solved. Once you know there's a problem and it can't be solved, there's no need to discuss the problem. I got problems with sleeping. I got problems with wanting to get to society. I got problems with wanting to be with my woman. <laughs> you know, that's just the way it is. So what were you talking about the other day, AIDS and condoms? Remember that? Well, I said that it is sex and prison. It is sex and prison. I think that... I said there is sex in prison. There is sex in prison. In prison. A friend of mine named Joseph Allen, which name is Treetop, he once said the best sex he ever had was in prison. And so we know it's sex in prison because people die of AIDS in prison. We, we know that. So it should be condoms sold here due to the fact of the offset. I don't think nobody can deny it's not any sex here because it's homosexuality here. You know, I couldn't afford to see each man how to deal with his problem, how to get back to the street. I don't know. If I knew, I'd be back myself, and I wouldn't be doing 50 years. What did you do to get 50 years? Back rock. I got two, two 25 years since 50 years. Well, how did you make out of the bank robberies? Well, the money I got was none. I mean, it wasn't no time where I got a lot of money, because I didn't get the money that Oliver North got. But I got a lot more time. <laughs> So if I didn't get that type of money, only white collar crime pay. A man picks up a gun, he just 
say maybe $25,000, $10,000. He gets 50 years. A man does a white collar crime, he embezzles $2 million, $150,000. He gets three years and gets to go to Danville. It seems like he's kind of right about that. You know, it seems like the white collar crimes, they, or people that got a lot of money and stuff to begin with, connections, and they don't get that much time. I mean, somebody robs something gets uh, for ten, twenty thousand dollars, and they get fifty years. So he seems to be telling that you know that seems to be true. I never made dime, but when I'm three months short, they refuse to send. So I can definitely say that I didn't make out at all. I should have had a job working. <laughs> I would have fared a lot better. Uh, situation came up uh, where they uh, take away inmate was fixing Pat Cohane is the warden at Lewisburg. Over the pet. Yeah, there's a different uh, warden now. Uh, when I was looking on this, it's like Eric something or other. Last 24 years, he's worked his way up from prison guard to warden. Cohane believes in strict discipline for the inmates. He's one that uh, is involved or conviction is uh, surrounding a multi-million dollar cocaine conspiracy, conspiracy which he was a key uh, figure involved in. Also he has a history of uh, planning escapes uh, from other federal facilities. Because of that uh, security concern, uh, the writ was uh, temporarily canceled and they don't uh, rework their schedule as far as movement of this particular individual. Yeah, Everything else seems to be going pretty good. Okay, sounds good. The warden spends part of every day behind the grills, walking through the cell blocks. Most prisons I've been in, state prisons, when the warden's making rounds like this, he's got a bunch of guards around him. I mean, a bunch. There was only one place that it never happened at, at, and that was at Potosi. The warden was Larry, I can't remember his last name, but he would... Uh, he sat down at your in the child hall with you if there was an open space. Morning. Morning, morning. How are you this morning? Here he visits the special housing unit. Hey, you have to catch me next time. Yeah. How are you today? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm just eight, man. I'm wondering, I wonder when they're going to cut me loose, you know? I found out it was three and a half, three years, five months, and 12 days a day that I'm, I'm over my time. The parole commission is taking a year to answer the appeal of 2255. Okay. You know, I mean... Have you wrote me anything on this? Have I wrote you anything yeah. on this? Man, I haven't, you know... No, no, I haven't wrote you. No, I haven't okay. wrote you. But okay. I tell you what I've done. My lawyers have contacted you on another issue. No, forget. You know, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yeah. I don't take calls from your lawyer. I know okay? that, but okay. Yeah, here, here, here's a, here's what you need to do. Sit down. Put your. You probably don't take calls from the family either. A lot of wardens, you know, families call up asking about their loved ones, and, and they really don't can't get a lot of information. Issue in writing, send it down. I'll have I'll have somebody check your record, make sure that we're all right here. I mean, if you're supposed to be gone, we'll we'll, we'll honor that. Well, see, it's a dispute, man. You know, it was what it was. It, you're saying that the parole commissions they messed have, up. They, they, they arbitrarily and capriciously did not put me under the guidelines that I was under. Okay. The lawyer has got has got to incorporate asking the U.S. attorney now to please answer the, you know, the 2255. Okay. Man, I mean, I got 17 and a half years in on 18 years sentence. Okay. You know, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me cut you off. Put it in writing, send it down there, and I'll have somebody check your record out and see. Okay, okay? my name is Reginald Bell. Well, you send it, and I'll know it. Okay, okay. Uh, all right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm inside here seven weeks now, waiting to be released. You were down in K-Dorm? Were you down in K-Dorm? Status, huh? Were you down in K-Dorm? Yeah. Okay. Nobody told, tell me my status. Okay. They only write my number, my name, and hit and don't get back every week. Mm -hmm. That's been going on for seven weeks now, man. Okay. I want you to shed some light in my situation. Okay. You were, you were designated to Ray Brook? Ray Brook. And, the, and then after, after the fight down in K-Dorm, they took you off that status and you're not sure where you're going now? Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm <clears throat> inside... Or uh, inside this situation for seven weeks now. Have you dropped me a note on this? 
I wrote you a note and you didn't get a reply. Well, when? Me. When did you write me a note? About four weeks ago. Well, write me another. I'm going to write you Write me another and we'll look at it. Okay. Okay. You got plenty of air. It's coming out your lungs there. Mike, what are you going to do with me or something? All these guys down here in the hole complain they ain't getting no air. It's like the third one I've heard say that. You know, they, they need to do something about that. You know, they... Can I get some? Well, I ain't gonna be able to talk to you right now. Well, look here, we just tell these officers up here and let us get some air through his straight. No, 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 let's don't talk about they and us. Let's talk about you. I'll talk to you later on. Can you get some air in here? I don't know whether you heard that one guy yell and, and uh, say I was a, a, a liar. Uh, I might be a lot of things, but that ain't one thing I'm not. I am not a liar. I ain't never lied to one of these guys yet. And they know it. So I just wanted to deny that. <laughs> Did I, I hope I didn't sound too defensive, but they can call me anything else and they may be right, but I am not a liar. <laughs> Montgomery. Yeah, good morning. Uh, you have this report today charging you with codes 307, 330, 339, refusing an order, being on sanitary, and conduct which disrupts. An SHU cell 222 on 91589. And they claim that they advise you to rights at the hearing, right to have a copy of the charges, to be present during the hearing, and representatives and witnesses. You're off to come and speak for yourself or remain silent to present evidence to the DHO. Right. This is what we call uh, in Missouri, in the state prison, a team. You get a violation and uh, you go before the team. Basically, it's the caseworker. And they determine whether you're guilty or not. And usually, they'll find you guilty based on the officer's statement. It doesn't matter if you have witnesses, you can even have a guard as a witness. And, uh, and they'll still find you guilty on the, an officer's statement. Uh, I've had three or four witnesses before and still been found guilty based on the officer's statement. So let's see what happens here. You get a copy of the hearing report when hearing's over, the right to appeal if you're found guilty. Okay, I'll read the charges to you once and we'll get your comment. Your statement. Mr. Pinchuk says that... Um, you started to flood the range of the second floor of the SHU outside your cell with water. And he said he approached the cell and told you to stop. And what do you want to say about that? I'm saying, man, that, um, like I said, like my roommate here, verify that too, man. I explained to the man about the, you know what I'm saying, about the plumbing situation in my room, man. And I told him that the toilet was really stopped up, man. Which in it, my toilet in my room right now is stopped up. The plumbing up there is very bad. And I explained that to him, and I have told him several times about it. Like, I have told him about my new room I have now. I got shit packed all the way up my toilet as of right now, where I keep telling him the toilets up there is messed up. He keep talking about they're going to get the emergency plumber. He tell me they don't even have them. The plumber haven't been up here in I don't know how long. I tried to explain to him. I did not flood the cell. Inmate Montgomery stated that the flooding of the SHU's cell floor and corridor floor resulted from his toilet being plugged up as opposed to his actually up as opposed to his. his deliberately flooding the cell floor period you want to ask the witness come in i guess this is his silly that he called for a witness yeah come back here brother close the door okay have we met before? No. Okay, my name's Cron, right? The hearing officer, and I'm hearing this report with him in Montgomery where he's charged with flooding his cell on 9-15-89. Did you see what caused the toilet to run and flood? Did you actually see? No, not exactly. You know, what caused the toilet to flood? Well, I know I cleaned up everything. It wasn't nothing in the toilet. So it wasn't about it being stuffed or nothing. Okay, what's your full name? Wayne Bogan. Dwayne? Wayne. Wayne, he's saying to me he didn't actually see whether you were causing the toilet to flood deliberately or it was plugged because he said he didn't actually see it. 
So I believe you were flooding deliberately, based on what the officers say here. I'm taking, I'm taking their words over yours. <laughs> See, he's taking the officer's word over him. <laughs> it's every time. I guess even in the federal prison. Now, I'm going to insert 317. It don't make no difference. Ever since I came down, every time somebody come down there, they're guilty, man. You know, it's an officer statement over the other statement. It's like last time I came down there, man. You know what I'm talking about? The officers had a written report that they, the same day the incident happened, but then they, they, they wrote the same incident report the same day it happened, but they turned it in a month later. Come on, man. Come on, man. Every time somebody okay. come down here, man. I'm sorry, I just so, ain't got the complexion for the connection, man. That's all. So I believe you're guilty of... Uh, I know. So 399, 307, no 317, okay? Because I believe you're guilty of the charges, your sanctions will be uh, DS 30 days, and I'm going to... Use a repetitive factor for code 307. It's the third time within a year. DS for 30 days, that means uh, disciplinary segregation. Okay. And uh, loss of commissary privileges for three months. For three months. Ain't that something? Thanks for coming in. You know? Ain't nothing but your regular, man. You know? Ain't nothing but your regular. Yeah, I'm not blue. Because the incident report charges were upheld, inmate Montgomery will be spending an additional month in disciplinary segregation. Yo, man, Montgomery, the bro was trying to get the shower, and he got his visit done. 7-7. Willie Strickland was serving time for armed robbery in a Washington, D.C. jail when a prisoner riot and takeover broke out. Strickland was one of the ringleaders in the takeover and was later charged with murdering four of his fellow inmates. Strickland was then transferred to a federal penitentiary and sentenced to life in prison. If you be locked up a long time, you get used to anything. You can get used to being by yourself. You can get used to what, hey, you know, like. That's true if you're strong-minded. If you're not, if you're weak-minded, you, you can, like, lose your mind in some place like solitary confinement. I, I, I'm, a, you know, it's just me against the man. You know, the man, he, you know, he, he won't lock me up. So who, who I got to cry to? Who, I mean, who, who really cares? Do you, do you think that anybody in society really care about what the man do to me inside these prisons? So who do I cry to? So I, I do my time. He, you know, he, he can't lock me. I figure like this. He just can't lock me up forever. I know I can't do no four life sentences. And, in a cell 23 hours a day. So sooner or later he gonna, lock, he gonna let me out somewhere. You know, a lot of people say, hey, strict, strict, he done killed a lot of people and stuff like that. But that, that's true, you know, that's true. And it, it don't take no great uh, uh, skill to kill anybody or anything like that. It don't take a, it don't take a, a violent, a person of uh, extreme violence, say, oh, this dude is a, an extreme violent person or, or or he's inside of him. He's uh, he's uh, full of malice, or he's uh, 
uh, uh, some type of monster or something like that. I, I'm not none of them things. Actually, I'm a very nice person, you know, uh, to somebody start doing something to me, you know, I'm, I fight back, you know, and if somebody die in the course of me fighting back, you know. So, he's a very nice person, so I wonder how, what, his defense of why he went to prison to start with is, you know, and somebody, he says he doesn't don't do anything to somebody does something to him. So how about those original charges that guy put in the D.C. prison anyway? You know, what was it? Uh, D.C. jail or something they said? So, well, you know, I, I go to war with people. If somebody want to go to war with me, I go to war with them. Come on, Tim. Let's go. Come on, Tim. Come on, Tim. Come on, Tim. This is an elite group of guards who belong to the prison's SORT team. SORT stands for Special Operations Response Team and is similar to a police department's SWAT team. SORT teams are required at high security level federal prisons. They are intended to be used in times of crisis, like hostage taking or prisoner rioting. But most often they're called in when an inmate threatens a guard or refuses staff orders. So uh, they want to tell us about the outfit you're wearing. The uh, basically they're just black jumpsuits, uh, and then they'll be put on with a grab one for you. Uh, hey, where's your where's your flak jacket at? Flak jackets. They wear these to protect. These are what uh, we used in Vietnam, and they're basically to protect them from getting hurt if an inmate's got a uh, shank or something tries to stab at them. These will protect them from that. The helmets that we use are have a basically a football type helmet with a, a face mask in it, and then a shield, protective eye shield. But with knee pads, elbow pads, <coughs> hand pads, protect their hands. And basically, that's about all the protection that they have. They look pretty much like a football player. Protect their hands from when we're hitting inmates, beating them. They don't, their hands don't get bruised. Trust me. It's nothing to induce pain, it's just to protect protect them from, from getting hurt. For legal purposes, the prison uses video cameras to record the sort team in action. This is Lewisburg's sort. But the cameraman is always in the back, so you can't really see what they're doing to the inmate. Team conducting a forced cell move on an inmate who spit in the face of a guard and verbally threatened him. Once the inmate is shackled, he is carried to a special restraining cell containing only a bed and a mattress. The inmate's arms and legs are handcuffed to the bed and he is stripped of his clothes.
He is checked for injuries by the medical staff. He's checked for injury by the medical staff, but... Uh... Um, he's checked for injury by the medical staff, but uh, he uh, they're gonna not report anything, you know. You know, if little scratches and stuff, he got not he got maybe being taken down, they'll they'll you know check on those, but like punch wounds and stuff, those won't be reported. You take after an appropriate time, okay. anywhere from two to eight hours, he'll be released. Warden Pat Cohane is recognized by corrections officials as the father of the sort team. I think, no, you don't take 1,500 uh, street conscious type guys who, who were born on the streets, uh, who were involved in fights and and physical kinds of things most of their life and put them in here and expect them all to be choir boys. I mean, they're going to they're gonna be confrontational from time to time. Uh, for example, when I was an officer, if we had an inmate who was disruptive and we had to, say, restrain the inmate for whatever the reason, uh, we'd open the door and we'd run in there and uh, it was really Katie bar the door. I mean, whoever was able to tackle the guy it was fine and whoever got hurt that was just part of the job and there was a lot of people got hurt officers got hurt inmates got hurt uh, didn't make a lot of sense uh, but that's the way it was uh, there was some abuse of inmates uh, as a result of those things uh, the sort teams uh, uh, you know, are, are definitely uh, something that we need. They're a good insurance policy. We hope we don't have to use them, but uh, when we do uh, have to use them, they're there. This inmate refused all orders to come out of his cell. back in the 90s and I'm sure it's uh, pretty much still the same way and, uh, thank you for watching and uh, hope to see you next time bye